A lot of ideas of what you will be able to build in your company or in your free time. And uh, following that, we, we said, okay, we'd like to structure the, the program into uh, three tracks, which you can see here. And um, as we know, there are many people just looking, let's say, kind of orientation. Uh, of course, there's lots of uh, sessions about the, the basics, the, the 101. Uh, of, of machine learning on the one hand and then secondly that's what we learned from the Berlin conference yeah we said we get a little bit deeper yeah so a lot of people wanted to see either more code or really the deeper and more specifically into deep learning to know how it works and what you can do with it that's why we also added a more advanced track 
Yeah. And last but not least, of course, there's a track for, for business and strategy, which means uh, uh, we are not a business conference, but, but we really wanted to have a, put a spotlight on, let's say, the, the, the impact which technology has on the business and organization and vice versa. If you can combine your business model and uh, your technology, especially with machine learning, you can do really interesting stuff. And you should basically change your entire business model if you want to go all the way. So that's why we included some sessions to show you what you can do if you go all the way with machine learning. Yeah. And uh, I think it's very important also that we have some, some inter interesting um, case studies for, for really from, from speakers who, who really do really interesting stuff in that field. So uh, we highly recommend to, to go to those sessions uh, as well, as well as, of course, to the other session about what Python TensorFlow, Deep Learning for J, and, and, and whatever is there to say on the technical side. And even if you are a developer, maybe pick one or two business sessions, because you can convince your boss to change the way he thinks and make the next step in this world. Yeah. So uh, we are really curious to understand who you are. <laughs> That's why we uh, just uh, wanted to ask, uh, maybe you should just raise up your hands uh, if you say, okay, you are mainly a software developer. Maybe you show up your hands. Wow, this is, this is 50%? Well, data just looking from stage. Yeah, but <laughs> okay, uh, who would consider herself, himself um, as a data expert, analyst, or data scientist? Okay, okay. wow. Good. Lots of you. And who's coming more from a, let's say, business and strategy background, uh, being more responsible for the strategy part, be, being neither a data, de dedicated data person or a developer? Okay, okay. I think it's a cool mix. Yeah? Maybe yeah. this really represents the, the parts in the program. Yeah, yeah I think so. Cool. Um, and there's um, another a few questions we'd like to ask. And, and yesterday night, uh, over a couple of yeah. beer, we defined the, the Boutonnier's Mayan ML maturity model. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> Famously quoted by the overall industry <laughs> since yesterday night. <laughs> since yesterday evening, we're going to write all of a lot of scientific publications about this. We feel it's going to be major. That's so, what's uh, happening over beer. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, uh, maybe uh, you just uh, show up your hand if you say, "Well, I'm more quite a novice. Uh, I'm, I'm coming here just to get the first touch, first, first for the first time in touch with machine learning, etc." Please show up. Okay. Interesting. Who's already experimenting with, with technologies and data sets and stuff like that? Okay. Okay, interesting. Then, um, then please show up if you really set up or, or have already set up your first, let's say, prototype, prototype with, yeah. with a business idea behind it. Okay, I like that. Okay. <laughs> then, number four. Does machine learning play a role in your company? Like, do you use data and do you use machine learning to analyze it? Uh, okay, already quite a few, that's interesting. And then last but not least, who is, whose company is really focused on monetizing data? Like, if you are a data company. Okay, quite a few. a few. So, please look at those guys who raised their hands right now, because they are the experts. So, annoy them <laughs> throughout the conference, they will be able to tell you a lot of interesting stuff. Cool. So, um, uh, what is also important is uh, also to, to look on the ethical side of what we are doing here and what we are talking here. Uh, um, last time we had also a wonderful keynote in Berlin about, uh, let's say, ethical considerations yeah, and about the, the, the fact that, of course, no data and no algorithm is, is bias-free. Yeah? Yep. Uh, and this time we also like to talk a little bit about that. Um, and we feel uh, that there is a cause of a, a moral obligation just to think about the impact of what we are doing. Yeah? So, uh, working with data and working with, uh, with algorithm in the, in the machine learning sense is not evil by definition, but there's a fine line and, and I th we believe uh, it's important just to, to think about these parts as well. Yeah, so, where is your algorithm helpful? and where does it get scary, like Cambridge Analytica scary. So I think it's really important for us that when we're doing stuff that we think about it. It's not just our boss who is going to tell us what decisions are made, because we are building it. We know what biases can be in our algorithms, so we should think about it. We should be attentive and sensitive towards that. And although we are all fascinated by the, by, the, by the possibilities which are there, we would really like to encourage this conversation at the same time. 
Uh, so stay attentive, stay sensitive, and uh, talk to each other, talk to us. Uh, we'd really, really like to find out uh, 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 what the impacts are. And uh, uh, well, in the end, uh, I believe uh, almost all of us, and, and this was also the conversation at the AI product workshop yesterday. Yeah? He said, well, people really wanted to talk about the ethic, ethics uh, part. So this is important. Having said that, uh, uh, I'm really happy to announce a, a, a keynote, which we're going to have um, um, to, um, this today after, after lunch, uh, which is about uh, China's uh, social credit systems. Probably you have heard about it. This is not only ML, yeah? but it's kind of an interesting but scaring way uh, how in China uh, uh, the state uh, really likes to, 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 to collect data and to, to educate maybe their people, but we are going to learn much more by Katika uh, Kühnreich. She's a political scientist and an expert in, in Chinese um, um, studies. But first... First, we are going to announce the next um, um, keynote and the opening keynote. Which is Xander Steenbrugge. He's standing over there. He actually used to be my student at some point, so I tried explaining him what machine learning was, what he should do with it. He wouldn't listen. But now he, the role is turned around. He started a video blog called Archive Insights, and now he's explaining me stuff about machine learning, so that's super interesting. And he's going to give a talk about cracking open the box of neural networks. Give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Does this work? I'm going to wait for my slides, my backup. OK, it's my laptop. It's not your fault. <laughs> Apologies. All right. Um, so my name is Xander. Uh, I'll try to explain to you guys what I feel are some of the most interesting developments that we've seen um, over the past few years that try and explain what neural networks are doing. So I'm going to start with a really quick introduction on what neural nets are doing if you train them for the people who've never actually done anything with them. And then I'll try to give an overview of some of these really new interesting techniques uh, that have been developed to actually look at these neural nets and see what are they doing after we train them on um, a data set. Right? So why is my clicker not working? Technology, it's fantastic when it works, until it doesn't. Try again. Yes. OK, so I'll start with a really brief history of artificial intelligence. So what a lot of people don't know is that the first paper on the perceptron, which is kind of the idea of you know, taking uh, this architecture that is in our brain, neurons that are connected, and trying to replicate replicated in a silicon chip, that's a really old idea. So the first paper uh, was from Frank Rosenblatt, actually was published in 1958, so that's exactly 60 years ago. And I read the paper last night uh, to freshen up, and this last sentence in the paper says that, by the study of systems such as the perceptron, it is hoped that those fundamental laws of organization, which are common to all information handling systems, machines and men included, may eventually be understood. So this is what this person claimed in 1958, and now 60 years later, I think we have to be honest with the fact that we still don't fully understand what our brains are doing, right? But we have come a really long way. So we came from the perceptron idea uh, in 1958, but now we have things like the backpropagation algorithm, which is used for training these neural networks. We have techniques like convolutions that are really, really successful if you're dealing with things like images, for example. And we also have uh, LSTMs or recurrent neural nets if you're doing anything with time series. So based on this very simple concept of the perceptron, a lot of new tools have been added that actually perform really, really well uh, in practice. And the three main reasons why machine Machine learning is really working today, whereas the theory was there uh, 60 years ago, but you couldn't actually do anything useful with it, is because right now we have really large data sets, so we can train these models on a huge amount of data. The models are very good. As we've seen, we have these, all these new kinds of toolboxes. And also, we have very, uh, very cheap computation. Right? That was because of the gaming industry. Uh, there was a lot of money to be made in making computer graphics chips that render really fast. And then it turned out that you can also use those same devices to actually train uh, a neural network very efficiently. So those three reasons combined make for the fact that machine learning right now actually works, whereas 60 years ago, it was more of an academical endeavor. But there wasn't anything useful uh, being done with those models. So to give you an idea right now, if my video will load, yes, almost. 
We can have these systems right now. This can just run on your phone. So you walk around in the street, you have this camera just filming uh, everything around it, and you have a graphics chip that is just in real time recognizing objects and looking around and sort of trying to understand uh, different objects in the world. Right? We also have things like image segmentation, where you can not only recognize objects, but also segment them, like which part of the image belongs to that object. Uh, we can do things like cancer detection. Uh, so this is a really big uh, new field in the medical um, department. We have things like real uh, speech translation. So right now, if you go to China, for example, a Chinese person can speak to you in Chinese. Your phone can take that audio form and translate it into a written Chinese sentence. You can send that sentence to Google Translate, which will translate it into a written English sentence. And then there is a model called WaveNet that can actually take that English sentence and speak it, transform it into an audio file. And so the result is that right now you can go to China and you can have a real live conversation with a person that speaks Chinese and your phone is doing all the work for you, right? And so behind the scenes, there are three different deep learning models that are doing all the work for you. Uh, but if you would claim that this was possible 10 years ago, people would never have believed you. And right now, this is a reality, right? So we're kind of seeing this really, really rapid progress and all the things we can do um, with deep learning. So the general paradigm that I think we are seeing right now is that we're coming from what I would call software 1.0, where you take uh, some kind of data and you have a programmer that writes a program, a piece of software, and then you run this through a computer and you get results, right? The new paradigm is a little bit different in the sense that you still have data, but what you give the computer is not a program, but you actually give it results. You give it supervised training data of the things you want your uh, program to do, and the neural network will actually learn this program for you. Right? This is kind of the new, the new paradigm. And I really like this quote from uh, Andre Karpathy. He's now the head of Tesla Vision. He says, neural networks are not just another classifier. They really represent the beginning of a fundamental shift in how we write software. They are software 2.0. And I think this is a really crucial thing to understand. Like Previously, a lot of these software programs were hand engineered by humans, whereas now we're seeing this shift towards automatically learning those programs by just giving uh, a lot of data to these machines. Um, and so in this talk, I want to try and dive in a little bit in what these things are actually doing uh, when we train a neural net, okay? It can spit out a program, but how does that actually work? So I'm going to start with a few slides uh, for people who've never actually done anything with neural nets. For the people who were here yesterday on the workshop, you might have seen this before. Um, but so imagine that we're looking at this image right here, which obviously we, we all can see is a nine, right? And so imagine we want to train our, our computer to look at this image and to actually think, okay, this image represents a nine. This is a digit. Okay, how would we do that? So the first step is that we can take this image and we can transform it into a bunch of pixels, right? So imagine that we're um, having an image of a resolution 28 by 28, and every single pixel in that image gets a number between 0 and 255, for example, where all the zeros are the black pixels and the high numbers are the white pixels, right? So you can simply take that image, represent it as a matrix of numbers. Then what you do is you take these 784 numbers, so if you just take all the pixels, you have 784 numbers, and you give them to this neural network. So that's the input of our neural network. And then what this neural network is going to do, very simply explained, is just a bunch of matrix multiplications. You're going to take all these numbers, multiply them with all these weights, you get to the second layer, and you keep doing this, and you go all the way smaller and smaller until at the end you have 10 neurons, Every single one of those neurons is responsible for detecting one specific digit, right? So what we want is that if we give an image like this one, which represents a zero, and we give those 784 pixel values, then we want this neuron to fire, to say, yes, I have seen a zero, and all these other neurons, they should remain silent because they have not seen the digit that they're responsible for. This is kind of what we want. Now, and then obviously, if we give it di different digits, then we want this uh, classifier to do a correct job at classifying digits. Now, the problem is in the beginning, what we do in a neural network is we take all these weights, so all these numbers that are doing these multiplications, and we initialize them with random numbers. So we have no idea what this network should be doing. We just initialize this completely at random, right? And so. Obviously, if we initialize all these weights with random stuff, then what's going to come out of our network is complete trash. This thing is not doing anything useful. It's not classifying digits. It's just giving random numbers as an output. And this is where the whole paradigm of supervised uh, deep learning comes in. Because if we give it this digit of a, a 3, then we actually know what we want our network to produce. We know that we want to see a very high number here, and we want to see zeros everywhere else, right? So we have this as the output of our network, which is completely wrong, but we know that we would actually like to see this. 
And that's kind of the, the whole core of training a deep learning model. You can compare those two things, and you can actually say, well, what is the cost if I give it this image, and my network says that this is the output, but I know that that should be the real output. I can actually compute a difference between all those values, and I can say, well, the cost of this misclassification is this number right here. And then what we want to do in training is we want to make sure that this number becomes as small as possible. But that's, that's the cost of making a mistake in our network. And then the whole idea behind uh, deep learning, if I try to explain it as simple as I can, is that you can, for example, imagine this weight right here, which is connecting this neuron to this one. What you can do is you can make this number a little bit higher. You can increase it a little bit, and you can look at, if I increase this value here, what happens to my output? Does it become better or does it become worse? If I decrease this number, what happens to my output? Is it better or is it worse? And so what you're then going to do is for all the numbers in this network, you can start like slightly changing them and seeing what happens here. And so what the whole backpropagation algorithm will do is it will change all these numbers in such a way that this thing right here becomes a classifier. That's kind of the gist of what is really going on. Try to explain it simply as possible, but this is really the core of what's going on. And so the result is that we can take a deep neural network, we can give it lots of training data, then we have this magical backpropagation algorithm, and out comes a program. And this program can look at images and it can classify them into 10 different classes of digits. And if you think about it, this is actually really surprising, right? So this was inspired by the brain, and it turns out that it actually works on real world problems. And if you think about what this neural network is doing after it's trained, a really nice way to think about it is that a deep neural network of 50 layers is actually a parallel computer that is given 50 time steps of computation, right? So you give it this input image, it performs one time step of computation, and then it does this over and over again, and at the end of your program, you have your result. That's kind of how I think about neural networks. But the whole thing is, okay, we know how to train them, but after you have trained this neural network, what is it actually doing? That's kind of what we want to get to, right? We want to understand why it's actually coming up with this interesting program that can solve our problem. So I'm going to try and explain a few of the different techniques that try to tackle this, this problem of what this thing is actually doing. The first thing I want to talk about is why do we even care about interpretability, right? If you have a neural network and it's doing a perfect job at whatever you trained it for, then why do we really care what it's doing, right? We shouldn't really care. Well, I want to give you an example. Imagine that you are a patient and you have uh, a disease. You are sick and you have to go to the hospital. At the hospital, they have a bunch of data about you. They know your symptoms, they have information about your DNA, uh, your travel history, your eating habits, uh, the amount of sports you do. So they have a lot of data about you. And they have two algorithms at the hospital. The first algorithm is what we call a white box algorithm. It's something like a decision tree or a linear regression algorithm, something that's very open and you can sort of see what it's doing. And so imagine that it spits out a fully interpretable medical diagnosis. So it's a full report which says, well, you have these symptoms, you've been to that country last year, and uh, you have this disease X, and I could treat you with drug A, but I know your genetic history, so you're not going to respond very well to that drug, so instead I will, I will give you drug B, and this should cure you. Right? So that's a very interpretable medical diagnosis. The second algorithm is what we call a neural network, and this thing is a black box. It just spits out, you have disease X, and we should treat you with drug Y, but you have no idea why it says that. Right? So obviously, in most cases, people would prefer algorithm A, because you can sort of interact with it, you can see why it's making certain decisions, and the doctors can use that report and actually you know, collaborate with the machine and try and make the right decision. Whereas in the second case here, the doctor has no idea why the network says that you have this specific disease, so it just has to assume that the network's correct. I would think that if you had to choose between algorithm A and algorithm B, every single one of us would go for the first option, right? Where your doctor can sort of interpret what the machine is saying and, you know, come to a collaborative decision. But the problem is, what if algorithm A has an accuracy of 90%, whereas the neural network does much, much better, right? then the decision becomes really tricky. Do you take this algorithm, which the doctor can interpret, but sometimes it makes mistakes, or do you take the neural network that is much more accurate, but you have no idea what it's doing? So maybe a quick poll, who would go for algorithm A? I see very few people. So I would assume that almost all of you would go for algorithm B, right? So we can already see the problem there. If we want to go for algorithm B, obviously that's a good choice because it's better, but still you feel that this is not exactly ideal because we don't actually know what it's doing. 
And so if you think about things like patient well-being, well, if this thing makes a decision which is really affecting your, your life, then obviously you want to trust that decision. You, you don't want to just gamble, right? The thing is, second thing is, what if somebody dies because of a mistreatment? Who is accountable for that? Is it the person who designed the algorithm? The person who trained the network? Is it the hospital who provides the data? Or the, the doctor who actually you know, takes the decision to start the treatment? Who is accountable if something goes wrong? And what about ethics? Do we allow these black box models to make decisions about life and death? This is a really tricky issue. And what about future improvements? If we want to improve on these systems, then obviously we need to understand what they're doing because otherwise it's very hard to, to improve them. So there's a whole bunch of these issues that actually start you know, pulling us towards we probably need to understand what they're doing. One final example is this data set right here, which is a bunch of images, and they trained a neural network to sort of um, you know, explain what the network is seeing in these images with a single sentence. So you have these nice examples where you give it an image like this one, and it says, well, this is a person flying a kite on a beach, or a person skiing down a snow-covered slope. And then people who read this paper say, wow, you know, this AI is getting really smart. It really understands the world, and it knows what's going on. But then if you read the same paper, you also find images like these, for example. You see, you know, it says a group of people standing on top of a beach. Or, you know, an airplane is parked on the tarmac at an airport. And it's kind of obvious that these things are completely wrong. It's not at all what's going on, right? And so if we want to understand why these algorithms are making these very obvious mistakes, we need to understand what's going on. And so here, what is going wrong is kind of obvious. You know, in the training data, it saw a lot of airplanes, and all those airplanes, if there were also, if there was also asphalt in the same picture, then 99% of cases, that airplane was parked at an airport, right? Because a crashing airplane is not a very usual circumstance. So it never saw this in the training data, so it also never you know, learned to generalize to the fact that this is not a normal situation for an airplane. But again, you can see that if we want to make these models better, we sort of need to understand what they're doing. OK, so how do we figure out what this network is really doing? Um, the first approach is a very simple one. Um, it's called data set examples. So what you can do is you can look at this neural network after it's fully trained. You can take one, any neuron in the network. You just pick a neuron. And then what you're going to do is you're going to feed a whole bunch of training examples, images, and you're just going to look at that neuron and see when does it fire, right? So for most of the inputs, this neuron is going to be black. It says, I am not activated. And for some of these inputs, suddenly this neuron is going to spike. And you can sort of look at all the examples in the training data set and see, well, when is this neuron spiking? What is it actually trying to do? And so here is a, an example from uh, a really nice blog post where they took a really deep neural network trained on ImageNet and they visualized four different neurons with some of the data set examples that they fire on. So here, for example, oh, here, for example, you can see that this network has learned to detect these fringes, right? There's always fringes in the images, so it's kind of obvious what's going on. Here you can see this fluffiness, dogs, and even buildings uh, in front of a background, right? So it's kind of obvious. And that's also where these really funny examples came from, where you can see that this neuron has learned to detect some pattern, but it's kind of not really clear is it detecting chihuahuas or muffins or labradoodles or fried chicken. And you have these other funny examples where it's kind of obvious what the, what the neuron is doing, but it gives these really funny uh, training images, right? Now, there is a very big problem with this approach, and that is that it's very hard to discern between causation and correlation. Because if I give you these images, and I ask you, what is the neuron doing? Then some people will say, well, it's obvious, you know, it's detecting a blue background, right? It's detecting sky. And other people would say, oh, no, 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 it's detecting buildings in front, right? Or here you could say, well, it's looking for a pair of eyes. And other people would, no would say, no, it's just looking for a nose. So the thing is that, if you see two eyes in an image, then very likely there's going to be a nose as well. So we have a very high correlation between those features, and we can't actually tell what the neuron is doing only based on these examples. So that's kind of the problem with the data set examples approach, right? So the solution to that was uh, a new technique called feature visualization, uh, which is a little bit better because what they do here is they start with an image that's completely random noise. So they start with a noise image, and they look at this neuron, and they start doing gradient descent not on the uh, weights of the neural network, but they do gradient descent on the pixels of that image. So they start optimizing this image so that it maximally activates a specific neuron. And so you can start doing this on an image, and you keep optimizing this image until it's really, really good at activating this specific neuron that you're looking at, and then you get images like this. So this is a pattern 
if you give it to this neural network, then this one neuron that you're investigating is really, really activated by this specific image. Right? So this, this gives us a little bit more information. And so here from the same blog post, you have, for example, this one uh, unit 499 in layer 4A. And this is the image that you get if you, if you generate an image that maximally excites that neuron. And here are some of the data set examples that also activate that neuron. So you can see here in these images that all of them contain buttons. And if you maximize an image to activate this neuron, you can sort of see the same pattern, right? So you get an idea, okay, this neuron is probably trying to detect buttons. You have other examples as well where here, you know, it's activated by clocks and tires, and this is kind of the pattern that you get if you optimize for this uh, neuron. You can do another one here where it's looking for birds and beaks. So it's kind of the images from the data set and the neuron. And on the left side, all the times you see what the neuron is not looking for. So this is if you, uh, if you look for the data set examples that minimally activate that neuron, so where the activation is the lowest. So obviously this tells us more about what it's doing, but it's kind of interesting that, for example, this neuron is least activated when you show it pictures of dogs. Right. And so this already gives us a little bit more information because we get rid of this correlation because we can really see this is the image that maximally activates that specific neuron. And so the general um, assumption that emerged from doing this kind of investigations on these deep neural nets is that what neural networks are doing is hierarchical feature composition. So it means that in the first few layers of this neural network, in the very beginning, they learn very, very simple things. They learn things like edge detectors. So for people who've been working on computer vision 20 years ago, this is basically what people were hand designing. You know, it's these very simple pattern detectors that can look for edges or specific colors. Then as you go up in the layers of this network, what the network is doing is it's taking these very simple features and it's trying to recombine them into more complicated structures. So you can think you have things like edges, and then these new images here are actually you know, combinations of those very simple features. And then as you go up the layers, those, those patterns become complicated and more and more complicated until all the way at the upper layer of your network, where you have your classifier, you have neurons that respond to very specific classes that we recognize as humans, you know, things like flowers and dogs and cars. So that's kind of the general assumption of what these networks are doing. You know, they take very simple concepts, they combine them into parts, and then at the final layers of your network, you have neurons that respond to very specific objects in the real world that we care about. All right? And there was a very funny example of a neuroscience uh, experiment where they wired uh, per a person's brain up to uh, an EEG device, uh, and they tried to measure brain activity. It was not an EEG device, but it was um, like a way to actually measure single neuron activations. And it turns out that all of us have one specific neuron that only fires if we look at the face of Jennifer Aniston. So just to show you how specific these activations can be, apparently in all of our brains there is one neuron that just does just this job. It fires on Jennifer Aniston's face and on nobody else, right? So that was kind of the general theory for a long while, that we have these neurons that fire for cats, others fire for dogs, cars, and Jennifer Aniston neurons, right? So people thought, okay, we've solved the problem. These things, you know, they do hierarchical feature composition, and then at the end, we have very specific neurons for all the things we care about. But then there was no new research, which was kind of recent from Google DeepMind. And what they said was, well, why don't we try to break these networks? So let's take the cat neuron and let's delete it from the network. Let's just get rid of it and see what the network does. And so their assumption was that if we take a neuron, like the cat neuron, you know, it's very obvious what it does because it's active for all cats and it's inactive for everything else. And the assumption was that if they delete it, then obviously the network is going to be unable to detect a cat because it, you know, the cat neuron is gone. And then there are also these neurons that, you know, they activate for seemingly random stuff and they're inactive for seemingly random stuff. So we really don't know what they're actually doing. And so the assumption was that if a neuron is very interpretable, if it's kind of obvious what it's looking for, uh, then deleting it would probably, you know, hurt the performance of this network. And if this, ne if this neuron is not really doing anything useful, then deleting it shouldn't matter that much, right? So the assumption was, I have these two axes here, it's just the interpretability of this neuron, is it kind of logical what it's doing, and the damage, the importance of like, what happens to the network's performance if you get rid of this neuron. So this was the assumption, right? If the neuron is more interpretable, then it should also hurt the performance of the network more if you get rid of it. The opposite assumption is that interpretability actually decreases uh, the uh, importance. And the uh, final assumption is that, well, the interpretability of a neuron doesn't really matter. This is what you would see if interpretability is completely unrelated to importance. 
So they started doing these on uh, deep conf nets that were trained on ImageNet, and this is the result that they saw. So they saw that actually 99% of these neurons, the interpretability has absolutely no influence on how important that neuron is. So it doesn't matter if it's a specific cat neuron or something that's kind of doing random stuff, it doesn't really matter. And in fact, there were a few of these neurons which are kind of confusing, it's kind of not really obvious what they're looking for, and they turn out to be really, really damaging. So that kind of breaks the assumption, like, you know, we have a Jennifer Aniston neuron, and if you delete it, then suddenly you cannot recognize Jennifer Aniston anymore. This assumption is kind of, you know, broken by, by this research. Uh, and then there was a final thing that they did. They looked at networks that were really good at generalizing to new data sets, and they looked at networks that were very um, much overfitted. So they were just memorizing the training data. And it turns out that if a network is really good at generalizing to new data, then you can actually get rid of quite a lot of neurons without hurting the performance. So if you get rid of half of the neurons, your network still performs really, really well. But if you do that for a network that's overfitting and you get rid of half the neurons, then your network is completely broken, right? So we learned two things, which is that neural networks, they store information in distributed representations instead of in these single neurons. And the second thing is that if a network is really you know, good at generalizing, then it's much harder to break, right? So these are sort of the two assumptions that are commonly accepted right now, okay? So generalizing networks are much harder to break, and the information in this network is not in a single unit, but it's distributed across all the units. Uh, a final thing I want to note is this new technique called adversarial examples, which kind of, you know, shows this in incredibly interesting direction that is very unintuitive, and it's another big problem in networks that isn't really solved yet. So, Imagine we take an image, this one right here, and we give it to a classifier, and the classifier says, you know, this is a panda bear, I'm 57% certain, right? Okay, all is well. Then you take a second image, this one, to us, this looks like random noise. This is completely random noise, and if you give this to a classifier, it says nematode, which is apparently some kind of worm, uh, but it's very uncertain about this. The network says, like, I really don't know what this is. This is kind of a confusing input. And obviously, this image was not randomly generated, it was specifically engineered for a purpose. And the purpose is that if you take these two images and you add them together, but this image, first you multiply every pixel with a very small number, and then you add it to the pixel value in this image, then you get the image on the right side. So to us humans, to our visual cortex, it's exactly the same image. But you have to remember that every pixel here is actually the weighted sum of these two pixels, but this one is multiplied with a very small number. And so obviously we would expect that if we give this image to the classifier, it would still say a panda bear, because that's what we see. But suddenly the network says that this thing is an airplane, and it's 99% certain that this is an airplane, right? And so this was, you know, this was research that came out a while ago, and people were really surprised. Like, why is this happening? This is very unintuitive. And it suddenly broke all of the intuitions that we had about these networks, and it showed, like, okay, there are things that we really don't understand about these networks. To give you another example of how strong these adversarial examples are, because people said, well, okay, that, that works if you have a, a digital image and you, you, know, you can actually do this in a computer, but it will never work in the real world. So there was a research paper that said, well, Let's generate a generative, uh, an adversarial example, and let's print it on a piece of paper using a normal printer, and then take a picture of it with a camera, and the resulting image was still adversarial. So this is really impressive, right? Because you take this image, you generate uh, this adversarial example, you print it on a piece of paper, and then here it thinks that this thing is a safe or a loudspeaker instead of an actual washing machine, which is the normal image, right? So the problem is that these adversarial examples are not just a digital problem, they're also a problem in the real world. Because imagine that you have a stop sign, and we're living you know, in a world where self-driving cars are everywhere, and all of a sudden, somebody sticks a sticker on this stop sign, and the self-driving car doesn't recognize the stop sign anymore. Right? So you can already see why this is a really big problem in the real world. If we cannot see the difference, but the computers are completely fooled, that's a big problem. Right? So that's why these adversarial examples are sort of, you know, they created a big fuzz, because they sort of undermine our intuition about these networks, and they pose a really big threat in applying these systems in the real world. Um, I want to show you another example here, because I've been talking about images all the time, but a lot of these things that I'm saying are also applicable to other domains. So there was an interesting paper called Hotflip, where they showed that you can also create these adversarial examples for text. 
So imagine that you're looking at a sentence and you have a sentiment classifier. So they use this a lot on websites to, you know, to check the reviews of people. Are people happy about my product or not? You just train a sentiment classifier. You run this uh, sentence through. Uh, it's frustrating to see these guys who are obviously pretty clever waste their talent on blah, blah, blah. And it says, well, this is a negative sentence, right? And then what you do, you change one word. You change this word clever with the word deft. And all of a sudden, your sentiment classifier thinks that this is a positive sentence. Right, that's very surprising. By just changing a single word, you can completely flip the classification of this classifier. This is a problem. Even more, you have a document a topic classifier here, which has this sentence, you know, Chancellor Gordon Brown, uh, Labour Party, Conservatives, and it says, well, this is a statement about the world. And then you change one single letter, you change the P with a capital B, and all of a sudden, the classifier thinks that this thing is about business. Okay. So, these things are surprising, right? To us humans, this is exactly the same sentence. Okay, there's a typo, but it's the same sentence, right? And to a classifier, all of a sudden, everything has changed. So just to show you that this problem is not just for images, it's a really general problem with these networks. And people have tried to tackle this problem, but there isn't really a generally accepted solution. So it's still an open research question. How can you make sure that these systems are robust to these adversarial examples? And then I would also like to note that we, as humans, we might think that we're infallible, but we actually have these things as well. I mean, we all know that these lines are straight, but that's not how we see them, right? So our visual cortex looks at these things, and it says to us, you know, these lines are curved. But if we measure them, then this is an optical illusion because these lines are straight. So the thing is that we've sort of discovered that a lot of computational systems, they seem to be very vulnerable if you go outside of the domain that they're usually being applied to. And this is not just in neural networks. Apparently, our brain has it too. That's why we have optical illusions. And so the thing is that these, these generative adversarial examples, well, they're kind of, they need to be fixed because somehow our visual cortex isn't fooled by them. Right? So there must be ways that we can fix them because our brain isn't fooled by them, but clearly our brain is fooled by other stuff. Right? So there is a lot of research going on and how can we actually tackle those things. And then to finalize my, my uh, presentation here, I was going to to show a bit of the things that I'm really excited about, uh, about the near future in research that's going on in this area. So one of the things that I think is going to be very, very crucial is the difference between correlation and causality. So if we look at this image, for example, we see a bunch of people standing on the beach, then every single one of us knows that the people are on the beach because the sun is shining because the weather is very nice, and not the other way around. It's not because the people are on the beach that the weather becomes very nice, right? We have this intuitive understanding of the causality of this picture, but if you would give a training set to a neural network, it would simply learn that beaches, you know, people on the beach and good weather, they are correlated, but it would never know which one causes the other, right? And this is a very crucial fundamental limit in these systems that we have right now, is they have no idea how to reason about causality. So this is probably one of the most crucial things that we need to tackle uh, and obviously, a lot of people are working on this. If we're able to fix this problem of causality, then I think we can move towards uh, systems that have a much more intuitive understanding of physics, of how the world works. So things, you know, learning about when structures fall because of gravity or why things sink or float. You know, these things are kind of important. In, and that's what babies learn when they play with Lego blocks, but our models aren't really good at learning these things, right? They're very good at finding correlations in data sets, but they're very, very bad at sort of extrapolating this knowledge and finding new things. And so intuitive physics is kind of the gateway to transfer learning, where you have a model that can learn from a specific data set and then apply all the things that it has learned on a completely new domain. That's kind of a really big challenge right now. It's called transfer learning. And to be honest, the neural networks that we have today are really, really bad at transfer learning. So that means that if you train them on a task A, and then you give them a task B that's very related, that's very close, then they completely suck. They're really, really bad at taking knowledge from one domain and applying it to a new domain. And obviously, if you think about what, humans makes, what makes humans so smart, is the fact that we can learn something in a single domain and then apply our knowledge somewhere else. That's why humans are so successful, and this is a really big limit that our neural nets are having right now. 
And then the final frontier, I think, is these human-machine interfaces. They're much harder to build, of course, but that is probably where we have to go in about 10 years. So this is, think, this is what I think is going to be the major step in the next decade, is to try and design these interfaces that allow a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds to sort of interact with these neural network models without needing to have a lot of coding experience or to actually know what's going on. And so obviously the, the kind of most uh, four-lying approach is to use natural language interfaces where you can just talk to these machines. And you know, probably all of you have seen the, uh, the demo from Google Duplex. It seems very impressive what this system can do, but I think if you would spend 15 minutes outside of the demo talking to the system, it would be pretty obvious that that thing is actually really stupid. Okay. It was trained in a very specific way such that it can answer questions about restaurants and make bookings for you, but if you ask it anything outside of that training domain, it's going to be really obvious that that system has no idea what it's talking about. And that's what I mean with you know, learning about the world, transfer learning, causality. These are really fundamental issues that are absolutely not solved yet. I have one slide about my company, ML6. If you are interested in doing machine learning, you can check out our website. I also have another session uh, this afternoon where I will talk about how we apply reinforcement learning for the optimization of industrial processes. Uh, if you want to learn more about machine learning, I have a YouTube channel called Archive Insights, which you can also check out. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xander, for this, this impression introduction, impressing uh, introduction and this uh, little outlook you gave us. Um, and as you already said, uh, you are doing another session in the afternoon about um, industrial optimization. Yes. Um, before we start and before we get into the program, um, there are mostly two uh, tracks in parallel. Sometimes there are three as well. You find everything right on this, uh, on this level of the, of the conference center. Um, maybe then you can switch shortly. Um, please uh, use your, our uh, conference um, app on your mobile phone. It helps you on the one hand to, to find the right orientation. Secondly, in case there are any updates uh, for the program, uh, you find it also uh, in, the, in the app. Uh, we really try to optimize everything uh, in time. You find all the talks at the conference, and very important, please give us, and for, for, um, as well the, the speakers, uh, some feedback. How did you like uh, the talks? Uh, did it fit your expectation? Or maybe what, what can one change for the next iteration of the machine learning conference? Um, and last but not least, please give us an overall feedback uh, uh, to the conference, uh, what you liked and what we could do better maybe next time. And of course, as a big thank you um, um, at the end of the conference, when you go to the check-in desk, you receive a nice uh, t-shirt, which fits to the wonderful weather we have at the moment. That's it from my side. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. And I just say, have a great conference, talk to each other, grab as many information as you can, and uh, let's meet for the next keynote after lunchtime right here in the room and enjoy the sessions. Thank you. <laughs>